I'm a professional snowboarder. And I'm far from a public speaker. Uh, I, I barely made it through high school. And luckily, I had my girlfriend make me this PowerPoint. <laughs> um, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know what being a pro snowboarder entails, uh, here's a short video that actually won me gold medal from uh, X Games. Yeah. So here's that. And that's it, thank you. <laughs> um, no, like I was saying, uh, I'm not a public speaker. Um, I would much rather be doing that than be up here. Um, as you can see, these are my note cards. We're going back to high school. Um, I tried over and over again to memorize this speech, and uh, when I was practicing it, I just couldn't get uh, my point across. So. Here it is, I, I got my notes, I'm gonna be reading, I'm sorry, I hope that's all right. Um, <clears throat> so, what I'd like to talk about is fear. Uh, fear is, is, is an overpowering force. It is an emotion caused by a belief something or someone is dangerous. We all know that feeling. For me, I feel it in my chest. I feel it right now. <laughs> <clears throat> but fear can alter your life, like keeping you from starting your own business or fly, flying on planes, or if you're like my friend Cody here, maybe you have ergophobia, a fear of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, now fear is a very personal thing that is particular to you and only you. There are countless fears and phobias that affect people every day of their lives. Whether you're afraid of heights, spiders, confined spaces, clowns, or public speaking, <laughs> that fear is holding you back from a part of the human experience. <clears throat> to be general, I would say most people have a fear of death or of dying, which is a good thing. It keeps you from trying to pet a great white shark or hug a grizzly. Uh, for myself, that fear of death is a very real thing that I'm faced with constantly when I go out snowboarding. And it's not myself that I'm necessarily afraid of, but of the mountain. Now, who here skis or snowboards or snowmobiles? All right, listen, please. <laughs> Avalanches kill 30 people a year on average here in the US and hundreds across the globe. <clears throat> Avalanches can be massive and very destructive caused by weak layers deep in the snowpack that release from the mountainside. These are the type of avalanches that can take out buildings, destroy entire towns, or even knock trains off their tracks. Or they can be very small, six to 12 inches deep, uh, 25 to 50 feet wide, just enough to knock you off your feet and drag you through trees and rocks on the way down. I've seen them, I've been in them, I've lost good friends to them. Just imagine how helpless of a feeling it is when the, when the ground falls out from underneath you and you're left at the mercy of the mountain. Now here's a couple of uh, 
avalanches I was in. <laughs> <coughs> That was my first one. That was, that sucked. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I lived. <laughs> um, that's, that one is a perfect e example of what I was talking about. Uh, that, that first avalanche that happened, it was only a couple inches deep, but it grabbed my feet and it just tossed me off of a 40-foot cliff. Now imagine if I was over exposure or, or, or trees or, or anything, if it was a big slope, that could have easily killed me. <coughs> so, going back to my speech. Um, <laughs> now, just imagine that you've, got, that you've been taken for a slide. That snow and debris can get going highway speeds within seconds. And let's just say you survive by <clears throat> survive that ride by not hitting any trees or rocks. That sloth, that, <laughs> sloth, that soft, fluffy powder that you were just playing in, after all the friction and pressure, hardens like concrete. And at that moment, you are completely helpless. Your chances of survival live solely in the ability of your backcountry companions. And for them, they have about 15 minutes to save you. After that, your chances drop dramatically. And that's because <clears throat> your own warm breath creates an ice mass that you suffocate in. So this shit is real. <laughs> <clears throat> It'd be a terrible way to die. The decisions that I make in the backcountry can be really costly. But I love it. I can't walk away from snowboarding, and I love riding powder. I mean, who doesn't? So for me to keep doing what I do, I've had to come face to face with that fear and learn about avalanches and how they work. It's the only way for me to justify putting myself out in those elements day in and day out. When I was younger, I was simply following the leaders of our groups, but once I started leading groups myself, I needed more knowledge. This has been a shift, our, <clears throat> this has been a shift in our entire snowboard culture. The pros from the past used to go out into the backcountry with a case of beer and a bag of weed. They weren't concerned about having a beacon, probe, and shovel. It was just far less serious back then. But snowboarding has evolved a lot, and our entire industry started to realize the reality of these mountains. Now, thankfully, in snowboarding and mountain culture, the leaders are happy to share, the, share their knowledge, because we know it's not just a, up to one person in the group. To, it's the whole group to, that needs to know the, the realities of the snow. How you react and how efficiently you work greatly influences the lifespan of your friend or friends buried. So with the help of my peers, we've created an avalanche training camp at Bald Face Lodge up in BC, where each year we learn and train in real life settings. Last season, we had 30 of the top pro snowboarders come together to learn. And how that information trickles down to the entire community creates major change. <clears throat> and there are many other camps like this going on. Teton Gravity Research has a mandatory camp for anybody working on their film to complete. And Travis Rice just helped produce a safety video that coincides with his new film, The Fourth Phase, which is going <laughs> to... <laughs> that one's like... <laughs> uh, which is going to spread mountain safety to a much larger audience and motivate more people to find local classes in their area, like here in Tahoe. <laughs> I think the greatest part is how all these pro athletes and filmmakers have come together to not only educate themselves, but to use their fame to influence more people be to become avalanche savvy. Because at the end of the day, the snow doesn't care if you're in the backcountry of Alaska or the side country of Kirkwood here in Tahoe. If it's layered in such a way, it can kill you. Now, after all this training and experience, am I still afraid of avalanches killing me and my friends? Absolutely. At the end of the day, we are still putting ourselves out there. But by taking the classes and training each year, it becomes much more of a calculated risk. And I think that all of us can use that theory of calculated risk to help in fears in our own lives. Are you afraid of flying? 
What's the risk compared to driving a car? Do you love to surf but are afraid of sharks? What are the actual chances of being attacked? Whether what you find motivates you to get back in the water or you find yourself saying, you know what, the odds of that shark attack just aren't worth it and you never go back, at least you put the effort into learning about your fears instead of just blindly folding to them. Now, <clears throat> this all seems obvious. If you have a fear, you learn more about it and the statistics aren't scary. Yeah, right? Um, well, maybe these abstract scenarios aren't as real as what we need. For myself, I can't go into the backcountry and assume the snow is good based on what people tell me. I listen to their perspectives and I do trust the people I snowboard with, but I need to make my own evaluation of that snowpack. And that's for no other reason that it's my life in my hands. And I have to own that perspective. Now, in other aspects of your life, how often do you, do you just take someone else's opinion and call it your own? Although I do think talking about snow safety is a warranted topic here, tonight I'd like to bring up our culture of, cultural fears as well. <clears throat> now, there are many people out there that are afraid of entire groups of people, entire cultures, and that fear is terrifying. I'll ask, are you afraid of Muslims or the LGBT community? Maybe you're afraid of Mexicans taking over the US. Or maybe you're Canadian and you're afraid of Americans. <laughs> <laughs> See, <clears throat> we're talking about real topics here. These are fears <clears throat> that are tearing our world apart. And for many people, their only insight to these issues are what they see on the news or on Facebook. Isn't it amazing how advanced we are in so many ways, but how uneducated we are of each other? And that unknowing always seems to lead to fear and violence. Now, regardless of who I am, how dare I pass judgment on anyone, period. Because I can only comprehend what I think, what I see, what I feel. And there is no reasonable explanation that what I think is better or more right than what you think. So just like I need to know, <clears throat> just like how I need to know for myself how that snowpack is, I need to know the facts of our world before I jump to conclusions. So <clears throat> I guess that's my point. See, I have this fear that could potentially keep me from living the life I want to live. And instead of letting that debilitate me, I've chosen to go beyond my comfort zone and learn to find some real perspective of that fear. I've taken a combination of professional classes, books, learning from mentors, films, and personal experiences to create my own reality of that fear. And it's up to me what I do with that knowledge. Now consider taking that same mentality to apply to your own life, whether that's facing a personal phobia or you're something bigger. I'd imagine you'd be better off for it. So, invest in your fears, whatever they may be. Avalanche safety is a big one for me. So what are your fears? What is your avalanche? Thank you. <laughs>